There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. We're going to do that twice. Okay? So you'll remember that, right, as we get into the... Yeah. Yeah. Let's stand together, please. It's a little bit different, but it's still recognizable. Okay? Just got a little added influence by me. I've never heard that version before. Where'd that come from? Me. You made it? Yeah. That is awesome. You are so talented, brother. I love it. <laughs> That's great. I'm hoping you're going to start doing that more often so we can learn it better. That's cool. Jehovah Remix. Love it. All right. So um, hopefully you've been reading along with me in our little read through the Bible in a year thing. And... Um, if you have been, this week you read 1 John. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Apostle John, and then we'll look a little closer at 1 John. Uh, John is believed to have been the youngest disciple of Jesus. In fact, there are a lot of scholars who actually think that when he walked with Jesus as a disciple, he was just a kid. I find that hard to believe. But these guys who believe it, they're, they're not idiots. 
They have a reason for believing it. But nevertheless, we know that, um, again, according to tradition, he's the disciple that Jesus is said to have loved. I know he loved everybody, but the fact that it specifically says he loved him means they had a special relationship. He's the one that was likely leaning back on Jesus at the Last Supper. Intimate, friendly, close. They loved each other. So John had a unique perspective on Jesus. And so he wrote the story about Jesus that we know as the Gospel of John, which is unique. It's different than the other three. Um, he also wrote three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And he wrote the book of Revelation, which is interesting because, you know, all the other books are so, like, philosophical and theological and deep. And then Revelation is like the only book in the New Testament that's given over to prophecy. And it's amazing. In fact, there's a movie coming out on it. Have you heard about it? Nicolas Cage is starring in it, Left Behind. I'm pretty excited about it because I thought the Left Behind books were amazing. And if they're turning those into a movie starring a, a Nick Cage, that might be, that might be pretty, pretty interesting. So I'm holding my breath, hoping it'll turn out well. So the Gospel of John, the, the biography of Jesus, at the end of the book, John tells us specifically why he wrote it. Let me read to you what he wrote. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have, e have life or eternal life. So John said, I wrote this down so that you might believe in Jesus and be saved. And Jesus did a lot more miracles. I couldn't write all those down. In fact, if I wrote all those down, the whole world couldn't contain the books. The point is, Jesus was a miracle-working machine. If you read through the Bible and are amazed with his miracles, imagine that the Bible only records a handful of the miracles he actually did. I guess you, you, know, you just follow Jesus around and he's popping off miracles left and right which is not amazing knowing who that he was, but what's amazing is that there were people that didn't believe in him. How can you not believe in somebody who's just sprouting miracles left and right? And I'm not talking about parlor tricks, like make the pencil float in air. I mean, he was raising people from the dead, feeding people, you know, out of a basket of fish that he made out of two fish. Just amazing what he did. And still, people saw those miracles and didn't believe. John wrote, I'm writing these things down so that you might believe and have eternal life. So the book of John is about what Jesus did so we might believe. The book of Revelation is about what he's going to do, especially to those that don't believe. You've heard of the lion and the lamb? Well, in Scripture, it's the wolf who dwells with the lamb. But there's a little confusion because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. On his first coming, he came as a lamb. He came meekly to teach and to die for our sins. And when he comes back, he's coming back as a lion. And it's not going to be pretty for many people. So the Gospel of John, what Jesus did so we might believe. Revelation, what he's going to do to those who don't believe. That leaves us 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. 1 John, which we're going to be looking at more closely in a minute. 1 John is basically about how to be able to tell the difference between a true believer and a false believer. 2 John is a warning. Don't take false messengers into your home. From village to village to town to town, these people would show up and claim to be prophets of God, representatives of Jesus, maybe even apostles. And people would feed them and host them and, and bring them into their house and maybe even allow them to have Bible studies there. Second John says, do not do that if they're the phonies. First John, how to identify them. Second John, do not take them into your house. Don't even give them a cup of cold water. Third John, but the true believers and messengers of, of God that come through your village, make sure you're hospitable to them. So first, second, and third John line up beautifully. Well, if the instruction is, don't take in the phonies, definitely support the true ones, how do you know the difference? It's, don't think it's obvious. They are called wolves in sheep's clothing. 
they look like sheep. They look just like you and I. They don't look like phonies. It's not like they show up with horns and a pitchfork and say, I'm a deceiver. <laughs> you know, the closer the counterfeit is to the real thing, the more it deceives. So who's for real? If they're hiding behind a mask, how do you know? Because they just look like everybody else. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool all the people some of the time. And some of the people all the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. I don't want you to be fooled any of the time. Listen, Satan wants to fool you. His people are made to fool you. He is an intelligent super being and has lots of experience. He knows how to deceive us. John has written so that we won't be deceived. So I really hope you'll grab a hold of the epistle of John. Yeshua, remember their close relationship. Jesus said this. Be on your guard against false prophets. They come to you looking like sheep on the outside, but on the inside, they're really like ravenous wolves. So Jesus gave the warning. Jesus even said, by your, their fruit you shall know them. So John took that teaching and then expounded on it, expanded it, gave us many more details to give us a really like a super spy decoder ring. So when the phonies come in, we can, you know, examine them and know if they're the real deal or not the real deal. So in 1 John, there's all these verses that I call proofs of position. What you see on the screen in front of you are five columns for each, well, six columns, but five for each chapter. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. I'm not expecting you to write this down. But if you want it, you can email, it, uh, email the office and we'll send it to you. Under each chapter are the verses that I discovered that deal specifically with helping us identify the true from the false. So you can see there's a lot. Over there in chapter 2 is like 12 verses, just in chapter 2. Chapter 5 has two verses. So between chapters 1 and 5, we've got 27 verses in 1 John dealing with helping us identify the true from the false specifically followers of Jesus. 27 out of 105 verses, and that's 28% of the epistle. That's huge. So that's why I say that this is what the epistle's about. Helping us know the true from the false with these proofs of position. If they behave like this, then they're believers. If they behave like this, they're not believers. 27% of the epistle, 28% of the epistle, to help us know true believers from false believers. I've been doing this a long time, and I know a lot of believers. It might be too much to say most, but I will say many, many of you people listen to some of these false teachers and think they're the real thing. Be on your guard. I don't have time to look at all 27 verses this morning. I'd encourage you to go home, read through the epistle yourself, and write down the proofs of position. But I'm going to just give you a sampling this morning. We're going to look at three of them, give you an idea of what John teaches us to help us understand the true from the false. First one, for example, is 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. First example, here's what it says. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. So, according to 1 John, he says, if a person continues to sin, they don't really know Jesus. Does that make you nervous? <laughs> Certainly, it can't really mean that. Because everybody sins, right? Even born-again people sin. If you just looked at this in the English language and didn't know the rest of the Bible this would really discourage you because you would figure there's no way you're saved because we all sin. But before I knew anything about Greek, and I still don't know Greek, but I know the tools to use to help me understand the language. The context and the big picture helped me understand exactly what this meant. Because at first when I read it, I freaked out. It's like, how, how could that be? I believe in Jesus, I sin. Doesn't everybody sin? I thought everybody sinned. But it said, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. I keep on sinning. 
Let me help you understand exactly what it's saying. The word sin is an interesting word in English, just like the word fruit and the word fish. Is the word fish singular or plural? Yes. Fruit. Can you not have a basket full of fruit? Yes, you don't have to have a basket full of fruits. So if I just say, anybody who eats fruit dies, well, that could be true depending on which fruit you're talking about. Some trees have poisonous fruit, right? But see, without me saying some trees and poisonous, that first sentence sound, sounded untrue, even though it was true. Then I gave you the bigger context and you understood it. Same here. You can't just read one verse out of context and understand it. Also, there's the Greek language. This word, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin. The New, Amer the New International Version, the one I just read from, throws in that word continues to help us try to understand the Greek tense. If you were to read it in the King James, it just says, if you sin, you're not saved. Yeah, summarizing it. Oh. The idea is continue in sin. What do you mean continue in sin? Okay, you're a sinner, you know? You beat your wife, you kick your cat, you lie at work, and you cheat on your taxes. You're a sinner. You come to Jesus, you confess your sin, and you go home and you kick your cat, and you beat your wife, and you lie on your taxes, and you cheat at work. You're continuing to sin. Nothing's changed. What this is trying to say, there's some people who love God, but every once in a while, stumble into sin. Whoa! Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Ooh, yuck! I'm dirty now. Please forgive me. I hate sin. And they walk around, and every once in a while, they stumble into it again. But then there's other people. They don't stumble into sin. They like sin. They take it with them wherever they go. They want to always have sin handy. <laughs> Both sin... But only one really continues in sin. You see what I'm saying? That's what this is talking about. Steve, that sounds like a lot of work. How do you know? Aren't you just making that up to feel better? Because, well, here's how I know. First of all, if you took it without the context and understanding of the Greek, it says anybody who believes in Jesus never sins again. So when did Peter become a believer in Jesus? Was it when, before he denied him or after? Say, well, well, that would have been a sin. Yeah, so it must have been after. Okay, well, the Apostle Paul had to confront Peter for his hypocrisy and his refusal to eat with non-Jews when he felt pressured by some of the Jew, phony Jews from Jerusalem or the heretical Jews from Jerusalem. That was a sin, too. My point is, you look at anybody in the Bible except Jesus, and they all sin, always. The Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So, if it means what you think it says without further investigation, there's nobody in the Bible saved. And if Peter's not saved and Paul's not saved, I'm certainly not saved. And if none of us are saved, what's the point of this whole thing? Does it really mean that? No, I don't think so. Furthermore, let me share with you the three most important steps you need to take to study the Word of God to fully understand it. The first step is you've got to know the context. You can't just take one verse out. You've got to read the whole context. The second most important step in understanding the Bible correctly is you have to know the context. You just can't read the word or the sentence all by itself. You've got to know what it talks about. And you can only imagine what the third rule is. You've got to know the context. <laughs> context, context, context. Let me drive it home. Extremely important. This one verse, verse 6, was really troubling. Two verses later, listen to what it says. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So as soon as you read the context, you know that the plain look at it had to be wrong because two verses later, it seems to contradict what you just thought it said. If you keep on sinning, you're not saved. If you say you don't sin, you're not saved. <laughs> what? Look at the Greek, look at the context. Ah, I understand now. A person who gives their life to Jesus, they change. They don't love sin, they don't walk after sin, but they will stumble, stumble into it on occasion. So what is our first proof of position? Trying to understand the true believers from the false believers. It's a change in their lifestyle. It's how they deal with sin. Are they still walking hand in hand with it, or has there been a real change in their life? 
this is good for people we know intimately. We can tell. We know if they've changed or not. But what about the pastor whose book you found over at Gospel Supply? Are you reading the book of a false guy or a true guy? You can't examine his fruit. You don't know if he's truly saved or not. You don't know how he treats his wife. You don't know if he's an upstanding guy or a phony. That's right, you don't. So why are you buying his book? What are you saying, Steve? I should never read some other pastor's book? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just asking you, why are you buying his book if you don't know anything about him? Do your due diligence. Let's say there's a book out there on proper eating habits. And let's just say you don't know anything about proper eating habits. And the book says all sorts of wacky, weird things. Are you going to start doing it? Well, a guy wrote a book. He must know what he's talking about. He's a doctor. Of course, you don't know that he's really a doctor, do you? Or a doctor of what? He might be a doctor of auto mechanics who wrote a book on nutrition. I mean, you don't know. I'm just telling you, be careful. This is not a game we're playing. This is serious business. Just don't go onto YouTube and listen to any old pastor's sermons about weird stuff. I mean, how do you know if it's just straight from the pit? How do you know? Why waste your time? Be cautious is all I'm trying to say. First proof of position. Second one, I want to now look at a specific. I was just talking about sin in general for the first one. Now let's look at a specific sin. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Okay, that word brother can mean brother physical, can mean brother spiritual, or can mean brother as in a fellow human being. Kind of like the word neighbor. You should love your neighbor as yourself. It's just a fellow human being. That's all it's referring to. Anyone who claims to be in, in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. The first thing that came into my mind years ago when I studied this was groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Two very unique things about them besides being bad dressers. <laughs> they claim to be Christian, and they hate everybody who doesn't look as white as they do. They specifically hate black-colored people and Jews, and then everybody else. They claim to be Christian, but they hate people. So are they really Christian? According to John, so we got our secret spy decoder ring, so we can know the true from the false. Anyone who claims to be in the light, claim to be a Christian, but hates his brother, is still in darkness. They're not saved. They're not Christian. They can talk about being Christian all day long. They're not. Similarly, for the last 2,000 years, the number one persecutor of Jewish people, now, you don't see it a lot in our country today, but you've heard of the Holocaust where six million women, children, and men were tortured, abused, and murdered, and their crime is they were Jewish. Do you know what kind of nation Germany was? It was a Christian nation. It was Lutheran, and it was Catholic. All these people murdering and hating Jews, most of them claimed to be Christian. That was just the Holocaust. You go back for 2,000 years, basically till the, the birth of the Roman Catholic Church up until c current times, the number one persecutions, persecutor of Jews are people who have claimed to be Christian. So people say the church has persecuted the Jews. No, the per church has not persecuted the Jews. The false church has persecuted the Jews. They claim to be Christian, but they're not. Of course, Jewish people don't know that. How can they differentiate? They don't know. They claim to be Christian, they're Christian. So we're swimming upstream here trying to convince Jewish people, the Christians aren't anti-Semites. That's one of the reasons I'm inviting you to be part of the March of Remembrance next year. We're going to meet at Reed Park April 19th with several other churches to do three things. Take a stand against anti-Semitism. To remember and honor the memory of those who died in the Holocaust. And to build bridges with the Jewish community. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we had 2,000 people show up at that event. And we're going to march around Reed Park wearing shirts, holding up flags, saying, we're Christians, but we think anti-Semitism is wrong. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. This is just an ongoing lesson of what Moses said way back in Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love is the heart of God. If we're born of God, we behave like God. We think like God. We act like God. We feel as God feels. Hate is incompatible with God. So if you have hate in your heart, or know people with hate in their heart, that's incompatible with being a Christian. So somebody came up to me after services yesterday. This is somebody who fought terrorists on the ground in the Middle East, made a career of it, killed plenty of them. He said, so does that mean I'm not a believer because I hate terrorists? I said, no, I hate terrorists too. He said, if I could, I'd press a button and kill them all. I said, I'd press the button too. So how, how is this compatible with what you're teaching, Steve? Well, remember, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. What are the three most important principles for interpreting scripture? Context, context, context. You have to read everything the Bible says about love and hate before you can fully understand love and hate. I gave you a good practical application of how hate is sin. But all hate is not sin. God hates sin, doesn't he? God's not sinful. God hates he who sows discord amongst his brethren. That doesn't make God sinful. Hate, in its proper context, can be a healthy thing. I told him, you hating evil is actually a thing of justice and righteousness. Your hate shows that you're righteous, not that you're evil. If you hate people because of the color of your skin, you're evil. But if you hate evil people and want to stop them, you're righteous. Oh, okay, I understand, Steve, thank you. You're welcome. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Steve, that's just the opposite of what you said. Context, context, context. You gotta look at the whole picture. Your personal enemy, somebody who always plays their stereo too loud at three in the morning, drives you up a wall, don't hate that person, pray for them. Somebody who gets you fired at work because they don't like your smug attitude, don't hate them, pray for them. It's a funny thing, you may be really mad at them, <laughs> but the more you pray for them, the more your heart will go out to them. Next thing you know it, your hate's gonna be love. The behavior of praying for somebody you're mad at is also a loving behavior. It's a funny thing. God sent the children of Israel to war against people. Context, context, context. All right, third specific identifying feature to help us understand. The first one, those who keep on sinning. The second one, hate. Third one, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, but what's that mean, don't love the world? I love the beach. Does that mean I'm sinful and going to hell because I love the beach? Of course not. Well, what's it mean, don't love the world? God loves the world, for God so loved the world. Context, context, context. What does the world mean here? There is a context. It actually tells us right there what the world means. In the very next verse, listen. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. This idea of loving the world is referring to prioritizing in your heart the things that have no spiritual worth, or even worse, are spiritually worthless, bad, either negative or bad. And I emphasize the word prioritizing. It's okay to love a pizza, but more than what? More than your daughter? Then, then, then it's not okay. It's okay to love football, but more than what? More than your service at the church when the game corresponds with the church event? Hmm. I had a pastor friend, acquaintance really, but I spent some time with him. His test for knowing whether somebody was a true Christian or not, he said, was their checkbook. He said, give me their checkbook and I'll tell you if they're the real deal or not. In his mind, if a Christian didn't tithe, 
he doubted they were really a Christian. Now, I don't go that far, but I understand his sentiment. His sentiment is this, what do we value? What do we pour our true resources into? Not our lip service, but what do we really value? If your children need a new pair of shoes, and you have the money to buy them a new pair of shoes, but instead you make them wear worn out shoes with broken laces and holes in them, just because you don't want to give them the money, or because you'd rather buy yourself a new purse when you've got eight already, I'm going to doubt your love for your child and not feel guilty about doubting. God has given us everything, but we very grudgingly put a few bucks in the box. Just telling you, priorities. What do we emphasize? What do we think on? Everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man. So the world refers to three things. First thing, the cravings of sinful man. Now, the New International Version, the one I just read from, it's a good version, but it tries to make it understandable, and sometimes in doing so, the specificity is lost. Let me explain to you how this reads in another version. That word cravings is often referred to as the word lust. Now, I understand why they use the word craving. It's a true word. It's a good word. But we avoid the word lust because in our culture, it almost always refers to sexual things. But its true English word doesn't have that exclusive meaning. It's anything you really desire. It doesn't have to. Yeah, you know, it could be chocolate cake. If you really want it, that's lust. So it could be sexual, but it doesn't have to be. This idea here is having an unhealthy longing for something that appeals to your sinful nature. And that sinful nature, by the way, is not a good word either. The, the word is flesh. That's the word the Bible uses, flesh. The NIV puts it as sinful nature, and it almost always is. But flesh is not just sinful nature. It's your physical nature. Not everything in your physical nature is wrong. The word carnal... It's not always a bad word. It refers to the physical nature. When I'm done here, I'm going to go over to the bistro and have lunch. Why? Because I'm hungry. And I have to feed my physical nature. Is hunger a bad thing? No. Is eating a bad thing? No. But if I eat too much on a regular basis, maybe then it's become a bad thing. So the first thing the world presents to us is the unhealthy cravings for physical things. Now, you could just use your imagination to know what those things may or may not be. The second one is the lust of the eyes. Here, they use that word, lust, because they think it's referring sexually. But again, it doesn't have to be. I do like how some versions put it. What are the three things that constitute the world? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Lust and lust. An unhealthy passion for things that don't feed your spirit that might even harm your spirit depending on what they are and the third thing the boasting of what a person has and does which is odd because that seems to be what our culture magnifies you know you're looking for a new job you're going to lay out how wonderful you are you're going to talk about all your accomplishments how badly they need you, and how awesome you are. That's what you have to do to get a job nowadays. And yet, if you really feel that way about yourself, and you're always the one patting yourself on the back, you might have an unhealthy perspective of yourself. A little bit of too much pride. You know, I, I like to watch these shows on TV, like America's Got Talent and The Voice, stuff like that. Some of these people are just amazing what they can do. And yet most of them, because they're so new in their careers, are still humble. Some of them even give credit to God. Do you realize if somebody's beautiful, they're oftentimes arrogant because of it? Why? What did they do? They were born that way. It wasn't their fault. <laughs> Nothing they could do about it. And yet they're beautiful. Yes, I am. How can you be proud about something you had nothing to do with? That was a gift from God. Or a curse, depending on how you look at it. Some people sing very well. 
Some people can't even talk. The voice is a gift from God. So how can you boast as if you made it yourself? It was a gift from God. Some people are really intelligent. Some people are really strong. Man, I saw Shaquille O'Neal on TV again the other day, and every time I see that guy, I'm just amazed with his size. Have you ever seen that guy? Talk about eating your Wheaties. There's this really big guy he was standing next to, and the big guy looked like a hobbit next to him. You know, like a little boy. You could just pick him up and throw him. Now, he's an amazing athlete, and he worked hard to become a successful basketball player. But if he, he was four foot two, it never would have happened, despite his work. He had a gift from God. Nothing to take pride in. Just something to be thankful for. So, people who pour their attention into their physical cravings and are proud about who and what they are, that's a sign that they're not the real deal. Speaking about the things that we have and do, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, Jesus said, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus isn't saying you can't have stuff. He's just saying don't love your stuff. And he even gives us a practical reason, too, because it's not going to last. Your house can catch fire. Everything's gone. Everything you value could be gone. You can put your money into the bank account. The bank can collapse. Put your money into stocks. The stock market can collapse. Buy property. Fire can go through. Buy a lake. It can dry up. If you buy a nice car. You can get into an accident. Buy something somebody likes, they'll steal it from you. It's nice to have stuff, but it's only stuff. Easy come, easy go. Put your heart into heaven. The stuff that lasts forever. Stuff that has eternal value. Take that with you. It's dangerous to love this world. There's a, a, a um, I guess I'll just say a scholar, I don't know, a scribe, a sage that presented a parable on loving the world. And it's quite famous. Most of you have heard it. And uh, it's been made into a video. The sage's name is um, Walt Disney. <laughs> and the parable on loving the world is called Pinocchio. So I'm going to ask you to take a journey with me. Kill the lights, and I'll go back and kill the other lights. And we're going to go to Pleasure Island and take a look at the lusts of the flesh. We got some more Pinocchio to see. But first, for those of you who don't know this story, these kids have been deceived into a 
free vacation to Pleasure Island. Anything you want, it's there. And as you can see, they're going nuts. They get all the pleasures of the world, they figure for free. No consequences until the next scene. Let's take a look at the consequences. Finally there now. We haven't got all night. Where'd all the donkeys come from? Come on, come on, let's have another. And what's your name? Aww. Okay, you'll do. In you go. You horse will bring a nice price. <laughs> All right, next. And what might your name be? Alexander. Hmm, so you can talk. Y yes, sir. I want to go home to my mama. Take him back. He can still talk. Please, please. I don't want to be a donkey. Let me out of here. Quiet. You boys have had your fun. Now pay for it. Boys? So that's what... Pinocchio! Huh. Hear that beetle talk? You'd think something was gonna happen to us. Conscience. Nah, fooey. Where's he get that stuff? How do you ever expect to be a real boy? What's he think I look like? A jackass? You sure do. <laughs> ah, ah. Hey, you laugh like a donkey. <laughs> ah. Did that come out of me? Oh. Huh? What the? What's going on? Guess you're just going to have to go home and rent it to see the rest. <laughs> well, first, I need to apologize for my ch to my children for making them watch that when they were younger. That's terrifying. <laughs> it's like a horror movie. I didn't realize how frightening that was. We lived on Pleasure Island. Anything you could want in abundance, right here, right now. Satan has given us a playground, and his goal is to make a complete jackass out of you. And he will, if you let him. 1 John was written to keep that from happening. So I encourage you, it's only 100-something verses. Go home and read it, analyze it, understand it. Make sure you don't get deceived. Walk well with the Lord. And then maybe you also have the privilege of sharing with other people how not to be deceived and to rock, walk well with the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for the word, giving us some parameters, some guidance, so we know how to live our lives, mostly so we're not deceived by the phonies who are out there claiming to represent you but really representing the enemy Please help us, Lord, to know the true from the false, but especially as it applies to us ourselves. Help us to examine ourselves to make sure we haven't been deceived and aren't deceiving ourselves, that we truly walk in the light, that we love our brothers as we love ourselves. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand together, please.
will sing to you because of your great love. Love so rich, so pure, a love beyond compare. The place 
place and every time and every space and every breath that I take you in. You're the only one who satisfies, the only one that makes my life make sense. Amen. Well, I really hope you'll be joining us for lunch. If you're new and have uh, you know, not been to our Fellowship Sunday, please come on over as our guest. The rest of you, there's a suggested donation, but not required. We want to have fellowship with as many people as possible. So, oh yeah, one more thing. If you're new with us, um, please take this little card to the table by the main entrance. We have a little packet we would like to give you and a gift, but some information about our church. We're so thankful you're here. God bless you real hard. I'll see you over at lunch. You're dismissed.
you like me I've heard the rolling thunder I felt the crashing of the waves And though I've known your presence 